Finance Corporation um, has been around since 1990. Um, it's essentially a nonprofit mortgage lending company. Um, it receives funding from the city and the county through 2080 agreements, and those funds primarily go to um, forgivable loans that are attached to either new home mortgages or um, home improvement mortgages. Um, so it provides an incentive for people to move into certain areas of the city. For example, if someone were purchasing in one of our targeted areas, they could go through the Neighborhood Finance Corporation and receive an extra $10,000 to um, do some repairs to their home as well as um, up to $2,500 for down payment and closing cost assistance. So it's just really trying to get people to move into those areas where they may not have thought about moving into. Um, it's also one of our um, only non-income based programs, um, which is nice so that it, there's no income level. Uh, a lot of the funds that we use are tied to income, so it doesn't allow for the um, mixed income neighborhoods that are desirable. Um, another, similar to the Neighborhood Finance Corporation, we also have the Neighborhood Development Corporation that came in about 10 years after the Neighborhood Finance Corporation. Um, the Neighborhood Development Corporation was specifically targeted um, to look at some commercial, neighborhood commercial revitalization. Um, funds are provided to them also through the city through a 28E agreement. Um, they do some small-scale redevelopment, neighborhood, um, neighborhood commercial redevelopment. They also do some site assembly um, and just kind of help some local, small local businesses kind of get up and running in, um, in the neighborhood. So they're, they're, they're focused primarily on smaller scale. Um, they, they don't do a lot of large-scale projects in the downtown. They focus on our commercial or our, our neighborhood corridors. Um, other partners that we bring into the process, um, for-profit housing developers, we have um, for-profit housing developers that actually um, do use down payment assistance funds or um, new construction funds, federal funds, uh, CDBG and home funds um, to build new infill houses in some of these neighborhoods. We also have for-profit housing developers that partner with us. Um, to do low-income housing tax credit projects in the neighborhoods that we uh, work in. Uh, we also have a few, not many, um, nonprofit housing developers. We have a couple of owner um, that owner-occupied developers. Greater, Hab Greater Des Moines Habitat for Humanity um, is, is the largest one. Um, they build about 25 uh, units a year. And that includes some rehabs. They have started to do some rehabilitation projects um, of existing houses. So that's been a good, good step forward. Um, and then Home Inc. also is a nonprofit housing developer um, for single family. And then Anawim Housing um, does primarily rental housing in the neighborhoods. Um, other partnerships are kind of based on the needs of the neighborhood. We bring in um, youth programming, workforce development, um, colleges, local businesses, local schools, um, depending on the needs of the neighborhood that are identified. Um, another, another partnership or tool that has been developed um, is the Neighborhood Leadership Program. Um, essentially, there was identified in a Stockler, Stockler and Engler um, evaluation. One of the one of the concerns was the capacity of our neighborhood associations, um, and these classes have really been aimed at trying to develop the skills um, for neighborhood associations to build capacity and leadership. Um, there's core classes that focus on any, anything from run, how to run a meeting to um, communication skills to computer pro like different computer classes. Um, to electives um, that range from communication with city government um, and all sorts of different um, classes. Um, we've also, you know, in the past several years, funds have been shrinking and we've been looking for partnerships 
Um, and we've come across a couple of one-time partnerships. The one, the Thrive and Build Neighborhood um, Partnership, we'll be talking about in depth in a little bit here. Another one is the Wells Fargo um, Leading the Way Home grant that we received. Um, essentially, these two were, were similar in that they're almost sponsoring the implementation of a plan. So we've, we've worked with the neighborhood to develop a plan, and then we try to find a sponsor for it. Um, whether that be you know a for-profit like Wells Fargo or a non-profit like Thrivent um, Financial for Lutheran. Um, plan evaluation. At the end, as Amber was talking about, neighborhoods go through initially being recognized and being designated. And then as they move through their designation and they're, they're implementing their goal, um, at some point, a lot of the goals have been accomplished, and staff come through and do an evaluation of what goals have been accomplished, what goals haven't, and we have a conversation with the neighborhood about moving on to charter status. Um, and really, once the neighborhood graduates to charter status, they, um, they're not as involved with city staff. Um, we're always involved in all the neighborhoods if, if an issue arises, but this just kind of makes it official that city staff aren't at all their meetings and, and aren't as actively involved in their neighborhood. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a case example. Um, starting with the King Irving neighborhood, came into the program in 2001. Um, it actually took, I do believe, two years um, to do the plan in this neighborhood. There was a lot of disinvestment. This is a neighborhood that's just north of the downtown. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, the key issues in the neighborhood plan um, were are similar to, to many uh, distressed neighborhoods, vacant lots, the property conditions, um, rental issues, contract sales was a huge thing in this neighborhood, um, vacant and abandoned buildings, just it, it goes on and on. Um, so we started the implementation in 2003 um, of their original plan. And then in 2006, the city of Des Moines was invited to apply for a planning grant um, that focused on quality of life. Um, and that planning grant was through Thrive and Builds Neighborhoods. Um, we received the planning grant and were invited to apply for a million dollar implementation grant, um, which we did and we received. Um, we added another neighborhood, because King Irving is a pretty small area, so we added an additional neighborhood, the Mount Damon Presidential Neighborhood. Um, Habitat was a key player in this, and um, we got together a coalition of Sadie, I don't think we can hear your audio anymore. Sadie, if you're able to, if you could just um, try hanging up the phone and calling back in. Sorry to the audience um, while we get this uh, technical issue figured out. Hopefully just be just a moment.
think we might be able to hear you guys now if you try talking. Okay, can you hear us now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. okay. We're on the same phone and nothing that's very changed, far. so that's weird. Sorry. Um, when did we lose you? I think it was just the slide back. Okay. Talking about Thrive and Build neighborhoods? I believe so. I think it was right at the end of this when you were switching over. Okay. Okay. Um, so with the Thrive and Build Neighborhoods um, Coalition, we're still working in the same area as King Irving. Um, we've been working there for three or four years. We decided to add an adjoining neighborhood that also had a small kind of neighborhood association to um, see if we could build some capacity within the two neighborhood associations. Um, and they came together and decided on six priority areas. Um, housing still remains a huge concern, um, but then they added some different ones that were not in the original plan that was done in 2001. Um, they added crime and safety, um, employment and asset building, youth, um, neighborhood pride and perception, um, and then there was a vacant school building in their neighborhood and they wanted to conduct kind of a feasibility study and, and figure out what can be done with that building. Um, the Implementation Coalition consisted of, of a lot of different people. There was over 22 um, nonprofit organizations in seven different city departments. Um, not all of them received funds from the um, implementation grant. In fact, most of them didn't. But what did happen was we realized that a lot of the organizations that were involved, as you can see on your screen there, a lot of the organizations that um, became involved in this already provided services in the neighborhood. It was just that the services weren't coordinated and there was no communication regarding the services and things that were available to the residents. Um, so it ended up that a lot of our funds from the million dollars went toward um, communication efforts and a project manager and an outreach worker um, to really bring the services and stuff that were already available to the residents so that they knew about them. Um, the next few slides are going to focus on King Irving because we've worked there longer than um, Mondaman Presidential, so we have a little bit more data. Um, the colors and stuff on this don't really matter. It just They're just the different types of programs that were used. Um, it just illustrates that uh, over the last 10 years, over 23% of the residential properties in um, King Irving received some kind of housing assistance, and together there was about $12.3 million invested um, just in the housing stock alone. Um, and to give you an idea, I mean, this neighborhood has about 1,200 households, is it? I think about 1,200 households, so it's a pretty small area to invest. Um, that amount of money in. Um, the city also invests an additional $6.2 million into the parks, library, and infrastructure. Um, public nuisance structures were a huge concern when we first came into the neighborhood as well. Um, King Irving only accounts for 1% of the housing stock where they had 10% of the public nuisances. Um, so over the years we were able to really try to focus on getting those to the legal system and getting those structures taken down using um, federal funds. Um, it's important to note in the city, as a city, we don't um, put aside funds for demolition of public nuisances. Uh, we utilize CDBG funds, and a very small amount of CDBG funds, and citywide we're only able to take down between five and six public nuisances a year. Um, so to make a, a big difference in this small of an area was, was a huge success. Um, housing stock results are pretty incredible. Um, you can see the 2001 and 2010. This is from the assessor data. Um, I don't need to walk all the way through it, but essentially the homes that were in poor condition got better. There was a lot more homes that were in normal, very good, excellent condition. Um, <clears throat> You can see in the highlighted column, the percent change is pretty dramatic, um, especially in the home values, um, sale price, and sale, sale price per square foot. Um, and then if you look 
all the way to the right, you can compare that to, to the rise in, in the city as a whole. Um, and you can see that in the neighborhood, those were going up much quicker because of the interventions and because of the investments. Um, additionally, there was a major push to um, get people into mortgages and out of their contract sales. Um, not that all contract sales are, are, are bad things. We do have some nonprofits that, that work with families on, on contract sales, but to get them out of the contract sales that were taking advantage of them and then into um, a mortgage that's more manageable. Um, this is just the library that was um, invested in. They really enlarged the children's area and the teen area. There's a lot of youth in this, in this neighborhood. They also added a foreign language area because um, there's a lot of foreign speaking residents, um, foreign language speaking residents in this area as well. Um, the neighborhood was really supportive of the renovation and had a lot of input into what improvements were made. Um, I'm trying to move through these quickly because I know we're, we're running short on time. Um, Evel Evelyn Davis Park is the main park in the middle of the, the neighborhood um, that had a, a terrible reputation. <laughs> um, there was a lot of illegal activity um, that was going on there, violence, shootings, those types of things. Um, Almost a million dollars was invested in upgrading that park, and then um, an additional 500,000 was um, set aside to um, provide programming in the park. So to get people back in the park, to get positive things going on, um, it, that's made a huge, huge difference. Um, there's programming in the park every day, um, even throughout the fall and winter. Um, there's programming in the park, so it's pretty pretty incredible to see the difference in, in that park. Um, infrastructure improvements, Amber talked about our NERP program. Um, there was a lot of infrastructure improvements in the King Irving neighborhood. Um, it's amazing what new sidewalks, um, curbs, and you know street overlays or new streets, um, it, it makes a huge difference in the, in the perception of a neighborhood. Um, and you can see some of the statistics on what all was done there. Um, as we got into some more of the um, Thrivent Builds Neighborhood Goals, we got into more things like promoting safety. Um, we found out through a lot of um, outreach and stuff that a lot of people didn't know about the neighborhood-based service delivery program. They didn't know that they had a code enforcement um, inspector or a sergeant assigned to their neighborhood that they could call. They didn't know these things, so we really worked on promotion of the program getting the officer, um, you can see in, in one of the slides here, um, out talking to the youth, because um, that was another another huge priority. Um, they held safety fairs, street number campaigns, um, and then involved in that was also um, pedestrian safety um, and lead-based paint. I'll just mention a little bit. It kind of snowballed <laughs> into a promoting safety and health. There was a lot of initiatives around um, fire safety and uh, house numbering and um, lead-based paint. This neighborhood has an older housing stock, and uh, there was a lot of children in this area with elevated blood levels. Um, so working with Polk County Health Department, we have worked on identifying those children and um, doing lead abatement work in the homes in their homes in order to prevent further um, um, lead poisoning. Another huge thing, like I mentioned before, there is a ton of, of youth in this neighborhood, um, and so really getting the youth engaged um, and exposing them to things they hadn't been exposed to before was important for the neighborhood. Um, so they developed several new programs. Um, there was a Y in the neighborhood that had served as, as um, a health facility but became more of a community center through this process, um, much more of a teen center, a lot of programming, um, and then a lot of the programming that they did, they actually did out of the main park in order to um, have positive um, things going on at the park. 
Um, neighborhood pride and perception was another huge thing for the neighborhood during this process. They, um, this area has a negative perception citywide. People don't go to, you know, they, they don't go to this area. They think of this area as being unsafe. Um, and the neighborhood really wanted to um, send the message out that, no, you know, we're improving, we're getting better, it's safer, um, we've got a lot of things to offer. They held um, multicultural events and um, different national night out events and really drew people from not just the neighborhood but from outside the neighborhood to really see what improvements have been made. Um, some of the lessons learned just from this um, planning process and this um, initiative is really building that resident participation and leadership before taking on a project um, is important. Burnout rate was something that we struggled with in these two neighborhoods because the neighborhood associations were fairly small. Um, being able to hire that project manager and outreach worker to really oversee the goals of the plan, making sure that things were on track, making adjustments if needed, and really going out and outreaching to the neighborhood was important. Um, and trying to really incorporate the educational components into social events or other, other things that are going on. Um, some of the things that are continuing, uh, the two neighborhoods partnered with several other neighborhoods to form a group called Mid-City Connection. Um, as I had mentioned, one of the main things that ended up being a concern in this area was communication. People just didn't know what was out there. They didn't know that they could get home repairs to the city or through Habitat for Humanity. Um, so they've really formed this uh, mid-city connection that uh, main goal is communication in these neighborhoods and getting the word out there of different things that are going on. Um, they've also started a point of contact or what would be maybe known as a um, block captain program um, to also help improve communication. Um, there's a new initiative, the Evelyn Davis Center for Working Families, um, that the neighborhood has really been been working on, trying to get located near the neighborhood in an abandoned grocery store. Um, so they're really trying to work together, um, the neighborhoods in that area, because they realize that they can't do it alone. Um, moving forward, uh, some of the issues and challenges that we're facing, um, project coordination during implementation is, is a struggle. Once we've finished up plans, our city council, you know, expects us to move on to new neighborhoods, but and able to really, you know, implement those plans, it takes some coordination and not all neighborhood associations are, um, have the capacity to be able to um, implement their plans on their own. Um, we do not have place-based community development corporations here in the city of Des Moines. Um, we have our housing developers and stuff, but we don't have any what other people might say are CDCs or you know organizations that kind of take a holistic approach on a place-based um, basis. Uh, we don't have those type of corporations here as of yet. Um, neighborhood commercial area revitalization, something that we're really taking a strong look at um, now, um, and also looking at the possibility of land banking, which we currently aren't doing. Um, funding shrinking, everybody I'm sure knows that, um, and federal programs are starting to come and be more specific and more specific, so you got to fit that certain box. Um, so we're looking for more corporate sponsors um, and things like that. Um, housing rehabilitation challenges um, cost a lot of money, um, especially with the federal regulations. Um, we currently don't have funds set aside other than through the Neighborhood Finance Corporation for um, developers or nonprofits to come in and do these um, revitalization or new construction projects that isn't federal money. Um, the money we use is federal money, so it comes with all of the attachments, the lead-based paint, um, Davis-Bacon in some cases, um, a lot of those things. And so by the time you get these restored, they're just not, the amount of money you have to put into them, they're not feasible 
for a lower moderate income per purchaser. Um, one thing that we have been able to do, which in the state of Iowa, we're able to pull tax sale certificates um, out of the sheriff's sale in order and assign them to a developer, which we usually do through an RFP process. So that's one way we've found to be able to take some of these vacant and abandoned structures um, or vacant lots and get them relatively cheaply into the hands of developers without um, federal funds being attached. Um, redevelopment challenges, again, the commercial, um, the neighborhood commercial redevelopment is a huge issue. Um, this corner was one that we worked on, I think, for five or six years, um, just doing <laughs> 10 years, uh, doing the um, acquisition of, you know, acquisition of each of these parcels and then um, assembling the site. There was also ground contamination. Um, a lot of things we had to deal with, but in the end, we were able to um, to put a 16-unit um, mixed income rental complex here at that site. So um, we're looking to do more of that, I think. Um, where the funding is coming from, we're not quite sure, um, but that's something we want to continue to look at. Um, addressing socioeconomic issues is something that we know we need to do better, I think, in Des Moines. Um, we have as Amber mentioned, um, historically focused on physical um, infrastructure and housing and parks and that kind of stuff. But in some of these neighborhoods, um, dealing with the socioeconomic issues really um, is important. Um, things such as unemployment, um, education attainment, crime, youth, um, and involving a larger number of stakeholders in the planning process and also in the implementation. Um, just from the experience with the Thrive and Built Neighborhoods, it's often difficult to engage social service agencies, um, primarily because they don't necessarily have a place-based mission. So it's, it's a little bit more difficult for them to get to focus services in a neighborhood. Um, building neighborhood capacity is also a huge thing that we realize we need to work on moving forward. Um, we expect a lot out of our neighborhood associations. Um, sometimes I wonder if we, we have a little bit too high of expectations on our neighborhood associations. Um, we have them come and apply to us. They work with us through the planning process. And they're also um, expected to really lead the implementation process. So having a strong functioning neighborhood association is key to our um, program. So I think moving forward, we really want to look at more technical assistance to our neighborhood associations, more educational opportunities, um, more matching grant funds so that they can get some of these projects going on their own, um, things like that. Um, we're also looking at some new tools to engage people um, in new ideas for solutions, also just hearing from kind of a wider mix of people. Um, we recently it hasn't been all that recently now, but um, partnered with Mind Mixer and have a, um, revi it's called RevitalizedDesMoines.com, and essentially we're using it in conjunction with our planning processes that are taking place now, essentially an online forum where people can go in and uh, answer questions about what the needs are, but also brainstorm about what the solutions could be or what the resources are in the neighborhood. Um, and as you can see, the, the largest demographic there is the 25 to 34. Um, but we were surprised to see that you know there's a, quite a wide range of people in age groups using um, the site. So we're pretty excited about that. So far, I think we have over 200 um, users, um, which is pretty good considering we're working in pretty small neighborhoods right now. Um, as Amber mentioned, there's a couple of regional initiatives going on at the moment. Um, the Tomorrow Plan, <coughs> me, the Tomorrow Plan um, came out of one of the Federal Sustainable Communities grants. Um, it's really the first regional planning effort that we've undertaken in the Des Moines metro area um, and just really allows us to look forward to the next 40 years on how we envision growth um, and what types of land use, and, and hopefully it will be able to really 
um, rein in some of that uh, growth in the green fields that um, Amber was talking about earlier. Another regional initiative that um, is going on is called Capital Crossroads. It's a strategic plan that really came out of the business community. It's more focused on economic development, but does have um, some focus on really needing to invest in our neighborhoods. And um, it's currently in the implementation phase. And um, it's a combination of the business community, the city, uh, the county. Um, and it's really focused on the on economic development piece. And it's, it's feeding into the Tomorrow Plan that I just was talking about. So there are two regional plans um, kind of working side by side but are tied to each other as well. Um, this will be included if you want to um, look at any of these things. I know I went through a lot of them really quickly. Um, if you want to look at any of the web links, um, you should be able to, when they upload the um, presentation online, you can go to any of these web links to get more information. Um, and I think that's all. So with that, Brittany, I think we can open up for whatever questions there might be. All right, great. So our first question comes in from Clayton. Um, how did the Des Moines Garner, um, how did Des Moines garner interest from residents and neighborhoods in the process? We have an old housing stock with no organized HOA, but the residents have been uninterested in organizing in the past. And many residents in these, res in these neighborhoods are older as well. Did you see the demogra demographics making a difference in participation? Um, I think this is Amber. Uh, demographics definitely do play a role. Um, we tend to see more involvement in, in the middle to upper income neighborhoods, although that's not necessarily true. Um, building participation in our program is something that has taken a long time. Um, I think early on in the beginnings of the program, they probably spent at least the first five years um, building buy-in among the neighborhood residents. Um, the planners would go out into a neighborhood. We do, we always start with a mailing that goes to every resident in the neighborhood. Um, and we still do that now, uh, just notifying them that uh, we're going to be working in your neighborhood. We want you to be involved. We want to hear from you what your priorities are. Um, but I think it's really taken a long time to establish that uh, trust that the city seriously does want to partner with its residents about these things. Mm -hmm. um, and so probably the first at least five years of, of our program was spent uh, building that buy-in. And now we're at the stage where um, enough people are aware of the program. Um, they see things happening elsewhere in the community. They see those infrastructure improvements. They see uh, things about the Neighborhood Finance Corporation, and they say, we want that for our neighborhood. How do we get it? Um, and so by providing some incentives that are only available to those neighborhoods, um, I think that's one way that we get people interested in it. Um, the other thing that has happened over time is this culture of having neighborhood associations across the city. Um, and again, I think that's been uh, built up over time as, uh, well, this neighborhood over here Something, something's going on there, uh, and we want that for our, for our neighborhood. Um, and so the way that we've structured it is they get it by banding together and then partnering with the city. Well, and I think on a, on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis, there are still some areas in the city that, that don't trust the city. Um, and I know working in, in the King Irving and Mondaman area, it did take a little bit of, um, of legwork and groundwork going in. Um, you know, we want to provide you these services, we want to help you fix up your home, but people still aren't interested and part of it is a trust issue. Um, what I found was helpful was identifying people in the neighborhood that lived there that trusted the city that could go with me um, to different, two different meetings. Um, I also started by going to some of the churches um, and trying to do some um, outreach through some of the organizations that already existed um, to try to build up that trust. 
And that's a good point. We typically do start working with a small group of residents that are interested um, and then work with them to build the participation. All right, great, thank you. Um, our next question comes in from Laura. Can you please speak to how you include neighborhood improvements in your CIP? That's a very good question. Um, and <laughs> it's developed over the years, honestly, and it's part of, part of how neighborhoods have been um, really institutionalized in our neighborhood, in our, in our city. Um, we had been funding that, actually part of it, with CDBG um, funds, so not all of the neighborhood infrastructure um, funds came from the CIP. Um, so there was kind of an incentive or a matching, if you will. Um, but then it got to the point where our CDBG was shrinking and the program was so popular that Public Works um, ended up putting it into the CIP. And I think that's as part of how it, it just gets institutionalized over time. It didn't happen overnight, that's for sure. And it's, it's gone back and forth, too. Early on, I think neighborhood revitalization as a whole, the program had a stronger presence in the CIP, where there were um, specific sort of budgets almost that were developed in order to implement a neighborhood plan and work programs. Um, as budgets has, have been cut over the years, that has largely gone away. Um, and much of our program is not directly funded through the CIP. Um, Sadie mentioned the infrastructure. That piece of it is now. Um, a lot of the rest of it, the, the housing, um, all of the housing improvements that we make, uh, that funding comes from our federal entitlement funds and from uh, partners um, and the funds that we're able to leverage through them. Uh, things like park improvements, um, often that's us working with the Parks Department to um, get them to incorporate those items into their work programs. Um, and in some cases, uh, they reprioritize things that are already in the CIP or they may add, they may add some things. But uh, typically it's because we have working relationships with other departments. It's not that we have a specific, um, a specific line item in the CIP that is dedicated to neighborhood revitalization. All right, um, our next question comes in from Thomas. Can thinking in neighborhoods potentially tear apart the city? Do neighborhoods forget that they are part of the greater city of Des Moines? Yes. <laughs> um, yes and no. There are definitely pros and cons to uh, having this very strong um, set of neighborhood organizations, quite frankly. Um, they. The neighborhood associations do tend to be very strong advocates for their area. Um, and in some cases, I think they do overlook the fact that they're part of a greater whole. Um, and so it's something that uh, we try to remind them of when we're in the planning process. Um, however, when they are perhaps coming up against a specific development project that's occurring in their neighborhood, um, they may not always remember that. Um, and so it does definitely add some challenges to our political landscape. Um, I think some developers would say that it, it makes our processes a little bit cumbersome um, because we do ask them to uh, work with our neighborhoods, in, especially when they're working on a development project, for example. Um, but overall, uh, the council and uh, the city staff feel strongly that um, there are more benefits that come from having this system than there are downsides. And I do think that there's also been some, some recognition of that in that there's been some umbrella groups that have formed um, more regional in the city, like the Mid-City Group. Um, they, they've kind of formed together and are looking at their common issues. Um, we have one on the south side, a couple on the east side, and then we also have um, the Moy Neighbors, which um, is an umbrella group for all the neighborhoods that they um, come together to talk about citywide neighborhood issues. Um, so there is some recognition of the fact that, yes, we are a neighborhood association, but we do need to look at what we have in common across the city, too. 
Okay, um, our next question comes in from Alette. Do neighborhoods provide input on applications to the city for development permits or for variances? Yes, they do. Um, all of our, well, any item really that becomes uh, or goes in front of our Plan and Zoning Commission or our Board of Adjustment, um, when I talked about the recognized neighborhoods and establishing that communication link between the neighborhood associations and the city, this is where that comes into play. So all of those neighborhood associations regularly receive the agendas for the board and commission meeting, and each under each item it uh, specifies which neighborhood that project might be occurring in, whether it's just a variance or a rezoning case um, or something, a new development that's up before the Plan and Zoning Commission. Um, and so in some ways, the responsibility is on the neighborhood association to uh, watch those agendas um, and come forward uh, to those meetings and be present at those hearings if they have an opinion on it. Um, it's one way that we keep them informed. Um, we also ask the developers, as I mentioned, uh, to go out and meet with the neighborhoods if they are, say, uh, building a new project in a neighborhood um, to inform the residents of what their plans are um, and uh, get input on those projects. And that also often does lead to some negotiation with the developers um, on design, um, that type of thing. If, if we have funding going into a project, um, we do require that developers actually get a letter of support from the neighborhood association um, to buy off on the design and that it fits in with the neighborhood uh, landscape and that type of thing. Um, so if we have funding in the project, uh, we have a little bit more control than if we don't. Okay. Um, our next question comes in from Eileen. How are you positioning your distressed communities to benefit from the regional growth plans? Is this an explicit part of the regional growth strategies? Yes, I think it is for, for both of those. Um, regional plans, maybe the tomorrow plan a little bit less directly, although um, partly because of the, the grant requirements, um, they are doing some fairly extensive outreach into those distressed communities, um, trying to get their input and involvement. Um, now that can be a challenge um, as far as actually getting input from those residents, but I think they're making every effort that they can to uh, go to where those people are. Um, and try and reach out to them through their existing networks. Um, the Capital Crossroads Initiative uh, is dealing a little bit more directly um, with those distressed neighborhoods. They have one committee uh, that is focusing specifically on what they're calling the urban core, um, which is basically the inner ring neighborhoods right around downtown um, and tend to be our most distressed neighborhoods. Um, that's where we have the highest concentration of uh, low-income residents and also of minority residents. Um, and so that committee is focusing on uh, kind of that broader social service aspect, um, ways to improve the, uh, the quality of life for residents in that area, um, and ways to also um, uplift the skill sets uh, of the residents that are there, um, connecting them with uh, things like um, health um, for health outcomes um, as well as uh, um, employment training opportunities and things of that nature. So um, both initiatives are, are addressing them, uh, Capital Crossroads, a little bit more directly than the Tomorrow Plan. Okay. Um, our next question comes in from John. Has the neighborhood leader course um, led to increasing the capability of neighborhood leaders who are then elected citywide? Um, I think we've had some success in that. I think um, the a lot of the people who take the classes have already been involved kind of in the neighborhood associations and they're really just looking to increase their skills. Um, and the classes have really helped with some of those skills. As far as getting new people involved and new leadership, um, I think there's been some scattered success, but it hasn't really um, taken on the life that we were kind of hoping it would. Um, 
part of it, I think, has to do with the way we have it structured. We have it structured through an actual community college, um, so it, it seems kind of a little bit more prohibitive. Um, we're looking at, um, and there's, there's scholarships, so most um, people in low-income neighborhoods don't actually have to pay for the classes, but some people do if you don't live in a low-moderate income um, census tract. So um, we're looking at trying to do some education forums and and some sessions that are outside of that that are a little bit more less intimidating um, in, a, in a little bit different setting. Um, we actually have one coming up in July that's going to talk about uh, property maintenance and what neighborhoods can do to um, to address some property maintenance issues in their neighborhoods. So we're we're looking at trying to take some of the basis of that and make it a little less formal and less intimidating for leaders. Okay, um, our next question is from Eileen. Um, the LISC has 110 neighborhoods across the country engaged in comprehensive community development. Some get their plans approved by the city, some don't. How critical has it been in Des Moines to get the plans officially adopted by the city and the county? I think for us that's been extremely critical, um, and partially because the city's been the primary driver behind neighborhood revitalization efforts. Um, as Sadie mentioned, we don't have really any CDCs in Des Moines at this point. Um, and so there are not other organizations out there that are working on comprehensive community development. Um, it's really our city community development departments. Um, and so because of that, um, the city buy-in and the city investment into these neighborhood plans um, has been extremely critical. Uh, we're the ones that are, are coordinating the implementation in a lot of cases, even if we are um, putting the responsibility on other entities or bringing in other partners to accomplish it. Um, we're the ones leading the charge. Um, and so I think because of the way that our program is structured, um, that adoption by city council um, has really been key. Uh, the other thing that it does is it um, almost requires city departments to um, program these revitalization activities into their budgets and work programs. Um, and since a lot of the uh, improvements are happening on um, public property right away and parks and uh, other things that the city owns, um, you know, that's what our residents are looking for from our program. Um, and so uh, having those departments buy into it um, is definitely key. I think also within each plan um, there's land use recommendations and um, different types of recommendations as far as how the neighborhood would like to see itself develop. Um, and so by adopting them and making them part of our land use and our um, comprehensive plan um, requires that our planning and zoning commit, um, that, that PNZ or planning and zoning and the council actually look at those plans when they're making their decisions as well. All right, um, our next question comes in from Jim. Um, is there any work being done with blight ordin ordinances dealing with foreclosure and other issues? Banks should not be left off the hook. It's not something that we're currently doing. Um, we have been tracking foreclosures for a number of years now. Um, we have received uh, neighborhood stabilization program funds uh, from the federal government to uh, help mitigate foreclosures. Um, and so that's primarily how we've been dealing with that. Um, we have relationships with some banks, um, but there's, there is not, at least to this point, anything that we have been doing with um, ordinances related to blighted properties or uh, foreclosures. Unless they become to the state of a public nuisance or they're um, you know, harmful to, to the neighborhood or something like that, we can deal with them through our public nuisance process, um, but not in anything specific to foreclosures. Okay, um, our next question comes in from Laura, and I think this will be our last question for the question and answer session today. Um, do you use NCST for at all for acquisition? 
Um, yes, the National Community Stabilization Trust. Uh, we have worked with them a little bit. Um, neither Stadia or I are directly involved with the NSP program, so we would have to ask that planner a little bit more specifically. Um, I am not sure that we have actually purchased any property through them. Um, maybe one property, uh, but the rest of them we've acquired in, in other ways. Okay, great. Well, that will um, conclude our question and answer session. And if we didn't get to your question or if you have something you want to follow up with Amber or Sadie on, their emails are listed um, on the screen right now. Um, so with that, we'll conclude. And um, thank you, Amber and Sadie. And for the audience, I'm going to go through how to log your CM credits again for attending today's event in just a moment. So you can hang in there if you want to hear about that. Um, but thanks again, guys. Thank you. Okay, well, for those of you who are still with us, to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, please go to www.planning.org slash CM and select today's date, which is Friday, June 29th, and then select today's webcast, which is the City of Des Moines Neighborhood Revitalization Program, and this webcast is available for one and a half CM credits. And we are also recording today's session, so you will be able to find a recording of the webcast along with a PDF of the presentation at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast archive. And this does conclude today's session. I want to thank everyone again for attending.